Welcome to uh, Lawrence Buckley's Bar at the New Inn McCroom for a night of entertainment for LTV television. A uh, night of music, song and dance. And first we'll get the night underway with a three-hand reel from the Tri School of Dancing. The dancers are Bridget Angland, Carolyn O'Driscoll and Diane O'Driscoll. <laughs> And uh, now we have uh, Diane O'Driscoll and Catherine Anglin to sing for you The Wind in the Willows. And now we have Bridget Anglin to play for you on the accordion a medley of tunes. First there are two waltzes, one is Daisy and the other is called The Joys of Love and she's finishing with a tune called The Castle Polka.
And now we have uh, Bridget Angland, Caroline O'Driscoll and Diana O'Driscoll of the Tri School of Dancers back again to do an easy reel. <laughs> And uh, now we have Pat O'Reardon to sing Maggie for you, accompanied on guitar by Pat O'Connell. I wander today to the hill, Maggie, to watch the scene below. The creek and the shaken all Mill Maggie, where we used to long, long ago. The creek is gone from the hill, Maggie, where first the days is sprung. And the shaken old mill is still, Maggie, since you and I were young. They say I am aged and grey, Maggie, my step not as sprightly as then. My face is a well-written page, Maggie, and time alone was the pen. They say we have out Lift our time, Maggie, and fade the songs that we sung. But to me, you're as fair as you were, Maggie, when you and I were young. They say we are gaged and grey, Maggie, I'll step not as sprightly as then. My face is a well-written page, Maggie, and time alone was the pen. They say we have outlived our time, Maggie, and faded the songs that we sung. But to me you're as fair as you were, Maggie, when you and I were young. Oh, 
I'm thinking tonight of the old rustic bridge that bends o'er the murmuring stream. Twas there, Maggie dear, with our hearts full of cheer, we strayed neath the moon's gentle gleam. Twas there I first met you, the light in your eyes awoke in my heart a sweet thrill. For now far away, still my thoughts fondly stray to the old rustic bridge by the mill. Beneath it the stream gently rippled, around it the birds loved to trail. Though now far away, still my thoughts fondly stray to the old rustic bridge by the mill. I keep in my memory a love of the past. With me it is as bright as of old. For deep in my heart it was planted to last. In absence it never grows cold. I think of you, darling, when lonely at night, and when all is peaceful and still. My heart wanders back in a dream of delight to the old rustic bridge by the mill. Beneath it the stream gently rippled, around it the birds loved to trail. Though now far away, still my thoughts fondly stray to the old rustic bridge by the mill. And uh, next uh, we have Neely Coakley now who is going to tell you an old story. Well. Long ago, when uh, people used to be going to the middle, saving hay, they'd uh, take with them a jar full of lia ishke. You'd say, no, what was that? Well, it was a compound of sweet milk and water. You see, the milk in itself wasn't the best for the thirst, and of course the water hadn't the body in it. Well, they'd take that jar and they'd put it under a swart of hay, or uh, under a forest bush, or into a drain of water where it would be nice and cool when they'd want it by and by, and there is no doubt about it, but it was a great man for the thirst. Well, there was this farmer this way of a day, and he had a big metal with him, mostly bullmen. Yet there were neighbours, you know, that had been close to the bull during the year. And they'd give that man then a day in the bog spreading turf, or uh, a day at thinning turnips, or a day at the hay, as I'm alluding to. And, of course, with the big mehel, the earthenware jar made no battle. And by three o'clock, their tongues were out with the drought. Well, they were in the position that there was a public house not too far away, but they couldn't afford to go there because they wanted to take advantage of the sun, seeing that it was only a pity. Well, at that time, the farmer, he had a servant by working for him by the name of John the Dado. And the only thing I'll say about him is that he had no splink. 
or a real tear away of a man that could do nothing right. His grass cocks would be, would be medicocks, and his medicocks would be wines. When he should be shaking, he'd be raking, and when he should be making, he'd be barking at the dogs. Well, the farmer said to himself uh, that he wouldn't be at much of a loss if he sent John the Dejo to the public house for some porter. So he gave him the earthenware jar and one and fourpence, and he told him to bring a gallon of it. Oh my, that's all it was at the time, tuppence a pint. Weren't we all barn a bit late? Well, John the Dado, anyway, he took the earthenware jar, and like the man long ago that was sent into town for uh, the hooks and eyes, in case he'd forget he was running along and he's saying hooks and eyes, hooks and eyes, hooks and eyes, he fell, and when he got up, it was hooks and hinges, hooks and hinges, hooks and hinges. <laughs> well, it was something the same with John the Dado. He was running along and he's singing some little ditty to himself and the Amadan wasn't watching where he was going. He ran into the gate pillar and he made flitters of the jar. Well, he got up with only the handle in his hand and noticing nothing, he kept going. And when he arrived to the public house anyway, he threw the one and fourpence up on the counter and he said to the publican, give us a gallon of it. Well, the publican anyway, he got this, wit this big white enamel jug, the one with the weed lip in it, and he stooped down. Now, don't tell me what Uta Marling they used to be going on with behind that counter. You had this pilgrimage from tap to tap. A big spot out of the flat one, and a small spot out of the high one to put a tap in it. And when he had the jug full, he turned to John the Dado and he said, Where is your vessel? Well, it was only then that John the Dado noticed that he had only the handle in his hand. And you know, says he to the publican, that's funny, he said, because we were together leaving the field. <laughs> that may be, said the publican, but where am I going to spill this? So John the Dado, and here he began to think, and he began to scratch his head with it into thinking, and he took off the hat to give himself more room for that operation. And do you know, says he to the publican, couldn't you spill it in there? into the hat. The publican did, of course, he didn't care, he was paid for it. And uh, when the hat was full, there was a tie scorn of porter left in the bottom of the jug. And J the publican said to him, uh, where'll I put this? So John de Dado began to think, and you know, says he, couldn't you spill it in there? <laughs> well, John the Dado stuck off back to the field anyway, to the men. And when they saw him coming, they all gathered round him. And when they small, saw the small Lachani in a potter on top of the hat, prayers be, they said, is that all you brought? You know what a fool you think I am, said John the Dado. Just to see how they the rest of it here. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, after that anyway, some day, the farmer and the wife, they went to town and they left him at home doing the housekeeping and they gave him a list of jobs to do and they told him to be careful of the goose that was hatching in the box near the dresser because the goslings were out any, due out any day. So they told him then all the jobs to do and they stuck off and he began doing the jobs and the first thing he did anyway, he said he go making the butter. So he got this little Children, any of it is the old dash children they had, you know, the one with the beetle where it should be slashed up and down. And he put that up on the table and he took the reins off of the donkey's winkers and he tied it around the children and he left two loops on it in for his two arms so that he could tie it up in his back like a knapsack sprayer. He threw a tie scan of cream into the children then and he picked up two buckets and he went off to the well for two buckets of water and he making the butter at the same time. And of course, when he stooped down to fill the buckets, up went the bottom of the children. Well, he got a slash of cream here about the pole and it ran down inside his shirt. And he came back from the well and he kicking cream and lumps of butter out the legs of his trousers. <laughs> and when he came back to the house anyway, it was bedlam broke loose in earnest. The Amadan forgot to close the door. The cars were gone up in the room. The hens were inside in the press. And here was the cat up on the table and his head down to his shoulders inside in a jug of milk. And there was the dog and he lying below on the floor and he making love to a lump of bacon. 
Well, he hunted them all out the door, and oh, he felt so uncomfortable. He twaffed the clothes anywhere above near the fire, and he was going up in the room to put on his trousers. He put on the small little shirt in him, and he was going up in the room to put on the trousers, when he saw to his dismay that the goose was after rising after the eggs where she was hatching. And he put on his hand, and oh my goodness, the eggs were going cold. He didn't know what to do. Well, uh, he said, what'll the woman say now if she comes back and finds the birds dead inside the eggs? Well, he thought that maybe the heat of his own body would approximate for the goose. So he turned around and he sat in the eggs. <laughs> ah, well, now you see, he didn't put his weight on them, but you see, here he, he sat down the eggs like that, you see, keeping the most of his weight on his shin bones and, and on his legs and on his hands. When uh, there he was sitting in a very uncomfortable position, when who stuck her head in the door, only Mal Simon. Yeah, Mal was a girl now like moving on into years that never settled down. And when she saw the gatchet, nothing on, on him, only the shaft little shot in. Her jack was jack, so she had a rat. And, well, you know, Mal, so see, you don't know how uncomfortable I am here, he said. My two shin bones, he said, are going to sleep with the color graphene. And the box, he said, has gone up to my uh, hands. I know, Malsa, see, would you ever come over and put on your hands? Is there anything happening? Yara Mal came over, you're a real innocent old creature, or not. And she put on her hands and she began to feel the eggs below underneath him and she had, no, ja, no, 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 no egg broken yet. Then. No, no, she had, no, not a crack shell yet. Hmm, cry, Mr. She, there's one out. Do you know, so she, he has a strong neck, she said, it's where he's a gander. Hey, with, with that anyway, the goose came in the door, and of course when she saw the other goose sitting on her eggs, well she stuck her neck a mile out in front of her, and she came hissing up the kitchen for him. I can tell you that he was long putting the room door up off of him, and poor Mal had to part company with the gajli. Thank you. <laughs> And now we have Con Kenner to sing for you tons of bright gold. By a quarry, ye yellow one fine summer morning I strayed to view the green fields and trees that afforded great shade. And there I espied the harmless smile looking game, and for tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. <coughs> To view a nice girl, it being in the evening late, I waited a while outside Jack Sullivan's gate. To welcome me kindly, this charming young lassie, she came and for tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. On that ball in the green, when I'll see her coming to pray, my heart gets delighted with this charming young lassie to stray. She is free from all pride and all the time. Glad of that same and for tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. And tis down by the line of my darling, God herding her kind. You'd long to be nearer to hear her singing so fine. Her notes without rival the nightingale's melodious strain, and for tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. And if I and my darling together alone had been, we'd travel the mountains all to the top of Seafing. With a dog and a gun, we'd have fun and a great sporting game, and for Tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. And if I own my crew and all the land by the lee, all the fine farms from Blarney to Ballin agree, I'd give the man more that comely young lass to obtain, and for tons of bright gold, of course, I won't tell her name. 
And when I and my girl in wedlock we both are joined, with the clergy well paid for the labor considered so light, until such indeed her name I will not disclaim, but without any gold, of course, I will tell her name. And now we have Johnny McCarthy to play two reels for you. First he's playing Cross the Shannon and then he's finishing with Father Kelly's. <laughs> And you now we have Pat O'Connell to sing for you two songs. He's starting with the Jug of Punch and the second song is Dingle Bay. One pleasant evening in the month of June As I was sitting with my glass and spoon A small but sad and an ivy bunch And a song he sang was the Jug of Punch Up to Ralu Ralu To Ralu Ralu To Ralu Ralu To Ralu Ralu a small but sad on an ivy bunch And the song he sang was the jug of punch What more devotion can a man desire Than to sit him down by an alehouse fire Upon his knee a pretty winch I am on the table a jug of punch Up to ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu a small but sad on an ivy bunch And upon his knee was a jug of punch What more devotion can a man desire Than to sit him down by an alehouse fire Upon his knee a pretty winch Iron on the table a jug of punch Up to ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu a small but sad on an ivy bunch And the song he sang was the jug of punch What more devotion can a man desire Than to sit him down by an alehouse fire Upon his knee a pretty winch I am on the table the jug of punch Up to ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu To ralu ralu Upon his knee a pretty winch, iron on the table a jug of punch. 
And when I'm dead, I and in my grave, no costly tombstone shall I grave. Just lay me down in my native feet with a jug of punch at my head and feet up to a lure a to a lure a to a lure a to a lure a Just lay me down in my native feet with a jug of punch at my head and feet. Thank you. The sun was sinking o'er the west world. The fleet was leaving Dingle Shore. I watched the main rob in the coral as they marked the fishing ground near Skelligmore. All through the night, mentile until the daybreak, while at home their wives and sweethearts kneel and pray. That God may guard them and protect them and send them safely back to Dingle Bay. I see the green eye of a lyncham. I mind the caves around Loch Gay And the gannet winging with abandon As they mark the silver store that comes their way I also see a ship on the horizon she is sailing to a country far away on board are exiles feeling lonely as they bid a fond farewell to Dingle Bay Long years have passed since I came homeward And time has left me old and grey I'm always dreaming of my childhood And those happy hours I spent at Dingle Bay And those happy hours I spent at Dingle Bay And uh, now we have Jean McCarthy to sing for you My Little Old Log Cabin in the Lane I'm growing old and weary and I cannot work no more And my rusty leaden hoe I've let rest All master and all mistress Are lying side by side And their spirits are still roaming in the blessed but the only one that's left me is that little boy of mine in my little old log cabin in the lane. There was a happy time for us not many years ago when the darkies used to gather round our door. They used to sing and dance all night and play the old banjo. But alas, they cannot do it anymore. 
For the hinges they are rusty, the door has fallen down. The roof lets in the sunlight and the rain, but the only one that's left me is that little boy of mine in my little old log cabin in the lane. Dear Dad, you need not be so sad. Are melancholy now. There are bright and happy days in store for you. Although you're old and feeble, your boy is young and strong, and he love and cherish you forevermore. But the only one that's left me is that little boy of mine in my little old log cabin in the lane. Dear child, I am contented for the hour has quickly come. When I shall leave this world of any pain, all oh, the angels they will waft me to their bright celestial home from my little old log cabin in the lane. But the only one that's left me is that little boy of mine in my little old log cabin in the lane. Shin -shin. Now, uh, uh, viewers, next St. Stephen's Day, I would like to draw your attention to a historic event in the town of McCroom. It's a coming together, really, of McCroom GAA Club and McCroom Soccer Club, who will be involved in a charity game in the Castle Grounds of McCroom on St. Stephen's Day in the aid of senior citizens. I think this is a very worthy cause, and we would like as much support as possible. And uh, the referee for this occasion is going to be the Cork coach, Billy Morgan. And now I would... And now I would like to hand you over to the proprietors of the new Inn McCroom, Eileen and Lawrence Buckley, to have a few words to say to you. Well now, um, all good things come to an end and we've come to the end of our show and we wish to thank you all very sincerely for taking part. We wish to thank especially Denjo and Jamie and everybody who took part and everybody who came to support them. And, uh, we are here now for 12 months and we would like to thank all our supporters and we hope that you will continue your support for the coming year. Thank you all very much. And we, and we would like to wish all our, our supporters a happy Christmas and a prosperous new year. And uh, now we have Pete Hurley to sing for you a version of Mount Massey, the Flower of Macrome. On a pleasant and a fine summer's morning, I strayed by the banks of Salon to gaze on the beauty of nature. That emblem it for land and lawn. I stood for some time meditating until Solis bright rays had withdrawn till a damsel of a queenly appearance came down by the banks of Salon. 
Then we walked and we talked on together in a healing the pure morning air till at linked with a voice full of pleasure she said sir my father is there were I ruler of France or of Russia it is with you I'd soon bear the crown and I join you in wedlock my darling you're the beauty of sweet massy town sure it's now I'm retired from my story with a heart full of sorrow and grief there is no one on earth to console me or to give me the slightest release I will roam through the African desert until death will call me to the tomb for the sake of a charming fair damsel that I met near the town of McClum. And now we have Michael Lee Han to tell you a, a story really. It's the blacksmith's wedding. <coughs> I wouldn't marry a blacksmith. <laughs> Phaeton, I knew a girl from this quarter once and she married a blacksmith. Not that there was any fierce out and out love between them as such. Just that she was a yank and sick and tired of America and he had a couple of acres and a bahanine of a house in the corner of the field. So they made match and they made history. For they were the first couple from this quarter who not to go on a honeymoon. And when they came off the train below on Glenmoyer Station in Cork, the blacksmith turned to the Yankee woman in and he said, they're all looking at us. He said, they know. He said, we're fresh from the altar. Is there any way we could convince them? He said that we are actually fresh from the altar. Oh God, there is, says the Yankee woman in. Catch a hold of the bags there and walk away in front of me. <coughs> Be that as it may, they came home. And she started putting into effect ideas she saw fun. She wanted to change all the bahani in the house and put this color in this wall and that color in that wall and the other color in the other wall. The poor menin was nearly demented. And another thing she had, you know how it is with mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, she didn't like his mother. So much so that she made the poor blacksmith cut the tail off the sheepdog for fear there'd be any welcome at all for his mother when, he'd come, when she'd come every Sunday. <laughs> well, lo and behold, a station was called for the blacksmith. So the poor Yankee woman put into effect every idea she saw in Long Island and Manhattan. She changed all the colors of the walls of every room in the house. She put footpaths all round the outside of the house. A monkey tree here and a monkey tree there. The poor menin was nearly demented. Every evening when he came home from the forge, he'd be introduced to a new item of cutlery. A butter cooler with a roof in it. Salt cellars with chimneys in the gable in them. And another thing she told him, don't ever have sups of tea falling from her moustache. <laughs> the poor menin was nearly demented. Well, one evening he came home from the forge and he saw this damn fine Sussex cock standing up in the middle of the table, just next to a loaf of brown bread. Well, now he had this phobia about fowl in the house. So he stole out to the back, of the, the back of the cottage and he got the handle of a, an old broken shovel. Well, he stole foot for foot up on the Sussex cock and he drew a most merciful blow. 
and of course blew it down in the middle of the floor. It was one of those on the Milton things she was after bringing home from Long Island. <laughs> Another thing she told him to watch the way you talk and your elocution, she said. She said you say things like he have and she have. She said you should say he has, she has, they have. Well, every day at the forge, she'd be rehearsing it. We have, he has, she has. So the poor men in English get always mixed up. One Sunday morning after mass, he said to one of the neighbors, has they all the hair cut up over your country? <laughs> he said, sure if, they, sure, if they hasn't known, sure, they'll never has. <laughs> the poor man in was nearly demented. Well, one thing she warned him, that the morning at the station, one very important thing was the way to greet a Paris priest. She said, say, good morning, dear father. Fall already? <laughs> we won't feel it now till Christmas. Fall already, he said, wasn't that an awful stupid statement? <laughs> oh no, she explained to him, fall already was the terminology used in New York to describe the autumnal time of the year. Fair enough, so he said, we'll chance it. Fall already? <laughs> we won't feel it now till Christmas. Every day at the forge, she'd have fall already? <laughs> we won't feel it now till Christmas. And outside the church every Sunday morning, all the neighbors would have fall already? <laughs> we won't feel it now till Christmas. They were mocking the poor men in. Well, lo and behold, the night before the station, the Yankee woman in had Every ID she saw in America put into effect. She had the house listening. She had this thing in this wall and the other thing in the other wall and things up in the mantelpiece that the poor man he never even made in the forge and surely to God he made queer things. Well, she put him to bed early because she wanted to tidy the house when he was gone. But she said, one last thing you must remember, what will you say to the Paris priest tomorrow morning below at the end of the pet? Well, he said, I'll say, good morning, dear father. Fall already? <laughs> we won't feel it now till Christmas. Well, he fell into a fierce deep sleep that night, colour sob like that's her own bell of warning. And she had the whole spick and span. Well, at 8 o'clock in the morning, she was up at a quarter past seven, of course. The poor man Ian was still snoring above and never thought of the station. Well, she looked out the window and she saw the Paris priest standing below at the end of the pet with the wicked gate and he looking up with two eyes open as big as the tops of buckets. Well, she got into a temper and she hit the second step of the stairs and built to the brush. So much so that the poor blacksmith jumped two and a half feet off the, bread, the bed with fright. Well, he jumped out on the floor, jumped into a pair of slippers and came down the stairs like the devil in the four winds are after him. No, it being the autumnal time of the year, there was an awful fall of frost the night before. Well, no sooner had his two crooked legs hit the footpath when they were taken from under him, and he went skeeting down the path towards the wicked gate, two hands in the outstretched position. And he said, Good father, dear morning, what a day you came. I have a pain in my arse from the fall, and I'll feel it now till Christmas. <laughs> And uh, now we have Peter Sweeney to sing for you the Castle of Macrome. At last those walls came tumbling down, at last they are no more. Where dwelt those noble clansmen, those gallant men of yore? Within those walls brave men were born, and many met their doom. We all lament the day it went, the castle of Macroom. Renu Chini stayed there, and Willem Penn as well. Now if those walls could only speak, what stories they would tell. The proud salon flows gently on as a city in the gloom. It seems to say a sad farewell to the castle of Macroom. 
The castle grounds are lonesome now, the mist those ancient walls. For the older generation, happy days they must recall. And many's the happy hour was spent, and many a love did bloom. Many's the maid was born and won round the castle of Macroom. Now to end this story, sad the way it has been. Those walls are gone forever, but the grandeur I have seen. My thoughts go back to happier days as memory fills this room. I see again in fantasy the castle of Macroom. That concludes our night's entertainment from the New Inn in Macroom and our thanks again to Eileen and Lawrence Buckley for solicitating us for this, for, for this uh, performance and I now hand you over for the National Anthem. Sing a fina fall a top a yole geren wind are slow a tender on a coin the board vessel Chantir or sheen shar pasta, niog for fendir on a fendral, anog the hairs of a mabuel, the gal erguel, con boss no sail, the goni tren, the lock no Shahi Panik Aran Nabil.